Now, our top story is, of course, the ongoing debt ceiling debate that rages in Washington, D.C. After dueling primetime speeches last night, President Obama and Speaker of the House John Boehner, they seemed no closer to an agreement. Meanwhile, there are just seven days to the August 2nd deadline when the country would supposedly have to prepare for at least a technical default. Now, for more on the latest developments in this Beltway battle, we're joined now by our Taking Stock think tank. We have Sean Egan. He runs his own independent ratings company, Egan Jones Ratings, which is wholly supported by institutional investors. The company lowered its view on America's debt back in March. They saw something coming. David Addington is the vice president of domestic and economic policy for the Heritage Foundation. He served as chief of staff and counsel to Vice President Dick Cheney. And we have Heather Boucher, senior economist for the Center for American Progress, previously working with the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Congress. Great to have you all with us. Let me begin by posing to you, Sean Egan. What did you see back in March when you put the credit rating of the United States on negative watch? We've been watching the conditions with the U.S. for the past year. In fact, there's some analysts in our shop who said we should have downgraded some time ago. And uh, with a, a major credit, major important credit, such as the U.S. government, you want to be very careful, very measured in your response. So that's why we put on negative watch as of March 1st, and we downgraded as of July 16th of this year. Heather Boucher, the topic of a downgrade, do you believe that the officials in Washington, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, recognize that this could have a lasting psychological effect on investors around the world? Well, I think they must. I mean, certainly, I mean, that is a, that's an indicator that I think everyone knows certainly is a big deal. And certainly the full faith and credit of the United States is something that I would assume that policymakers understand. But of course, they're taking this to the brink, um, you know, in terms of getting this debt ceiling uh, discussion uh, finalized and completed and, and moving us forward. So it's hard to see that um, they're taking, we understand that they're taking it very seriously, but the, you know, the potential downside here in terms of if they they don't deal with it certainly uh, would be very bad for the U.S. economy. David Addington, uh, give us your impression on the dueling press conferences that took place yesterday between uh, Harry Reid, uh, Chuck Schumer from the Senate, as well as John Boehner, Eric Cantor on the House side, as well as President Obama's speech to the nation at 9 p.m. Eastern. Did that really do anything, or is that just positioning for who's going to take the blame if indeed we don't get a, get a deal? Well, uh, I remain confident that we will get a deal uh, in the remaining seven days. Uh, a big part of the problem, though, at the moment was the issue you raised at the beginning, namely, is Washington getting the message? And the problem is they only got half of it. Standard and Poor's and Moody were very clear. It's a problem if they don't raise the debt limit. And Washington got that message. But Washington didn't read the rest of what they had to say. And the rest of what Standard and Poor's and Moody had to say was, you've got to have substantial and credible reduction in our debt and deficit. Sean Egan, is this a situation where once the credit rating of the United States is lowered, in your case, you've already moved it from AAA to AA plus. Yes. Does regaining that AAA status have the same meaning any longer? No, it's uh, the mystique is broken. Uh, it's almost like finding out that your star athlete is all, has been taking steroids all along. Um, it, uh, upgrades take much more time than downgrades. Another metaphor is crossing the Rubicon. We had to think long and hard about doing it, about taking the action that we did, and we compared the U.S.'s financial metrics, credit metrics, to other countries, such as Canada. Canada has a debt to GDP about 30 percent. The U.S., depending on how you measure it, is over 90 percent. And it just doesn't give you, it's not, the, the country, unfortunately, isn't acting or sounding like what, what you like to hear from a AAA rated credit. David Addington, one of the words we did not hear from President Obama last night in his speech was the word veto. Is it possible that there could be a bill that's sent to the president's desk that he would then veto as a result of the indecision and the wrangling that continues in Washington? I think it's highly unlikely the president would veto a bill that reaches his desk on this subject. You'll note that last week when the House passed the uh, Cut, Cap, and Balance Act, which was a good step in the right direction of driving spending down. The administration put out a statement that said the president will veto this bill. 
But today, with the Boehner plan about to be voted on tomorrow, the president's uh, administration put out a statement that said the president's senior advisors will recommend that he vetoed the bill. That reduction in the strength of the signal from the president indicates to me that if a proposal gets through the Congress, and I'm doubtful about that, and I haven't seen a good proposal yet, uh, but if one gets to his desk, I think it's unlikely that he would uh, veto it. Heather Boucher, can you walk us through some of the chronology that might exist if indeed uh, Representative Boehner is able to push through a bill in the House? The Senate, at least from what we've learned from Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer, is not likely to accept it. What happens? The Senate proposes its own plan, and then what? We're running out of time. It's almost Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Well, we certainly are running out of time, um, you know, and as David just said, of course, the, the president d did say today there was a statement that came out that said that that his advisors would recommend that he would veto the Boehner plan. So even if that were to get through, which is highly unlikely in the Senate, um, that's certainly not going to be the plan. And that's because that plan would actually do more damage to the U.S. economy as well, um, perhaps not more damage than defaulting, but certainly it's, it's, it, it's certainly even odds at this point, the kinds of spending cuts would not be good for this economic recovery and I think that you know however this moves forward both the House and the Senate and the administration need to be focusing on getting the economy back on track and dealing with this in the most expeditious manner possible so that we can focus on the biggest problem which is dealing with unemployment. Sean Egan why do we even need a debt ceiling? I mean we're borrowing this money from ourselves and indeed about five trillion of the 14 trillion is money that is owed to trust funds such as Social Security and Medicare. The cap was put in place as a hopeful safeguard against running away spending. Um, uh, Heather, however, brings up a very important point that not only do you have to worry about the numerator that is a debt, you also have to worry about the denominator that is GDP. And with the cuts, you naturally get a cutback in GDP because government spending is part of that. So this whole process, because we're at a relatively high level, debt to GDP has to be handled carefully. Um, um, I would argue that perhaps a better way is not to impose a significant number of cuts immediately, but to take a more measured approach and get us on a path so over time we have a, a more uh, reasonable level of debt to service. David Addington, why is it not possible to split off these debates? Why can it not be passage of a debt ceiling measure, but then have the debate over the budget and budget deficits come later? Well, for the same reason that Standard and Poor's and Moody have made clear they would downgrade it, because that would demonstrate that the United States government is not serious about cutting its spending. We need to drive down spending toward a balanced budget, maintain our ability to defend America, and do all that without raising taxes. And that's the way from here to prosperity, and that's the way to get a more limited, smaller government that doesn't cost us everything we have. Heather Boucher, is it possible, though, that even if we do get some kind of resolution on the debt ceiling, that the credit rating of the United States gets downgraded by more agencies than Egan Jones? Well, that's, that is certainly a possibility, of course. But, I mean, the, the real issue here is whether or not we can get the economy back on track so that we can start to grow our way out of this uh, fiscal uh, crisis that we're in. So, you know, until we get our economic house in order, we're not going to be able to get our fiscal house in order. And, you know, what the rating agencies and what bondholders are looking at is not just what's going on in terms of debt, but what's going on in the overall picture of the U.S. economy. Are we growing? Are we creating enough jobs? And right now, you know, that focus needs needs to be on making sure that we continue spending uh, in, the, in the short to medium term until we get the economy back on track. All right, but Heather Boucher, I mean, is that likely to happen in the next seven days? I mean, is it possible that they can just <laughs> kind of reach some kind of an agreement and, as you say, all right, tackle the larger issues of the economy, but how are they going to do this in seven days? Isn't it likely that capital costs will increase not only for the government, but for many small, mid-sized and large corporations? Well, that was the danger in taking this this close to the precipice, right? You know, we've been talking about this for many months now, that you get closer and closer to this deadline and you do increase the risk that, you know, markets are going to start reacting and you do increase the risk that, that, we're, that we're going down a path that we cannot return from. So, uh, you know, what's going to happen, I think, is anyone's guess. And I think, you know, we can all uh, sort of spin out very scary scenarios. But the most important thing right now is getting through this hurdle of getting the debt ceiling. And then Congress does have a very 
very important job to do in terms of coming together and figuring out how they're going to deal with the economic issues facing the country. And they need to take the time that they need to do that they need in order to do that. David Addington, Congress is the one that's supposed to actually approve a budget. The president sends the budget to Congress. What's Congress's responsibility if the nothing happens by the end of the week? Well, Congress, of course, has the ultimate responsibility in all of this. Uh, they've controlled appropriations since the beginning of our Constitution, and uh, they've made all that money available. Where they started getting in trouble is when they appropriated massive amounts of money that they didn't have in the Treasury, and the government went to borrow it. Uh, Dr. Boucher is right about the objective. We need to get the economy growing, and we need to get people back to work. But the way to do that is to cut the size and scope of government and avoid raising taxes. The president wants to raise taxes. That cuts investment, cuts economic growth, and kills jobs. The president is way off base. Sean Egan, if we do not get any kind of an agreement by August 2nd, do you think that the U.S. government will miss payments on some of its Treasury obligations? Whether it does or not is almost secondary, uh, because what has happened is that the, um, uh, the U.S. government will have sent a message to the market that it's not at the top tier that everybody had hoped that it was. When you step back and you look and find out why it is that the U.S. Uh, debt has increased by basically, uh, what is it, six trillion dollars over the past five years, uh, some thought might be given to, you know, why it's at that level and what we can do to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. Sure. John Egan, are you seeing investors moving to other types of assets as a result of this? Uh, to a certain extent, however, there are relatively few. You uh, remember the whole structured finance market is gone, basically. So you just have a few sovereign credits where you still have a AAA and, uh, and a few corporates, but there aren't that many beyond that. All right. I want to thank you all very much, uh, Sean Egan, uh, joining us, as well as uh, David Addington and Heather Boucher.